Hi there, welcome to the Accidental Pop Star here on YouTube. My name is Ali Begg. I am a former sports broadcaster, an author, and I was once a member of 1990s boy band Bad Boys Inc. We were signed to a and Records for three years between 1992 and 1995 and we had relative chart success in the UK and abroad before we went our separate ways in the spring of 1995. My journey left many unanswered questions and my fleeting brush with fame made me start to question the type of person that I was becoming. So what's the idea behind this channel? I'm going to be interviewing pop stars, both past and present, who have had similar experiences and who have a similar story and see if we can find common ground. I'm absolutely delighted to welcome to the accidental pop star a good pal of mine, former drummer with Let Loose, Lee Murray. We're heading back to my old stomping ground, the mid-1990s. In 1993, Let Loose released Crazy For You, but it didn't quite make the top 40. Fast forward one year, they released it again, and this time it went all the way to number two, selling hundreds of thousands of records. Let Loose had a number of hits between 1994 and 1996 before they decided to go their own ways. I'm delighted to welcome to the accidental pop star, drummer, Lee Murray. Hi Lee, it's great to see you mate. Thank you so much for jumping on. It's been a rather long time. Eh? It has been a long time mate. It's really good to see you. How are yeah. you? Thank you mate. Um, I really appreciate this. Right, let's go right yeah. back to the beginning. Right back. Did you always want to be a musician? Uh, yes, pretty much. I think there was a really popular boy in in the classroom when I was a very, very young kid. You know, everyone's got one, a really sporty guy that, you know, just had that, that one of those sort of personalities everybody gravitated to, even from a really young age, you know. Um, uh, and he liked Cars by Gary Newman. This was back, I, I reckon I was about nine, eight or nine. And it was my first experience of, because he liked, I, I sat next to this kid, and because he liked it, I thought, well, oh, I'm going to like it too, you know, because he's really popular and it might make me popular. And it, it didn't. But I listened to that song and um, and then I, I was just hooked on music. I couldn't decide whether I wanted to sing or play the drums. But I'm not really a singer, to be honest. I'm a drummer that sings a bit, but I just, I, I really sort of latched on to this particular artist and his drummer as well. His name was Cedric Sharpley, I think. So from then on, from about nine, ten, something like that, I was just absolutely obsessed with music. So quite young, you know. Did you drive your mum and dad mad playing the drums? Oh, man. I'll tell you something. I know something. I don't know if you can see this. This is an electronic kit, which which are fairly uh, new in the last sort of 10, maybe 15 years, something like that. But we're going back to the 80s when and you only had the really big, loud acoustic drums. Mm. I swear to God, I mean, I, I, my parents were quite liberal in, in that I could play it whenever I wanted. And um, and I did sort of play, to my shame, about 11 o'clock at night sometimes. I was just obsessed. I'd play for hours and hours and hours. That's in my... I'm slightly on the spectrum, so I've become very, very uh, obsessed with things. And, uh, and music was one of them. So the amount of neighbours that would, <laughs> would come... And they'd only last sometimes a year, 18 months. And I'd be going, oh, another, not, another one's gone bad. And he'd go, yeah, we'd be waving them off. <laughs> so I was just clouting these drums, you know, and they're, and they're pretty obnoxious noise, as you can imagine. So, yeah. See, so when you got together with the lads, um, how did that work? Were you guys at school? Were you at college? Did you have jobs? How was that process? So I was about 17, I think, when I, um, when I, answered an advert in, so we were a bit, I suppose old fashioned really looking back uh, at how we got together because through the sort of, from the sixties onwards until sort of the late eighties, the only way to get into bands was to was to get Melody Maker and they had the classified ads in the back of this music paper. So if you were a musician, um, you tried to find sort of like-minded you know, lads and girls or whatever that were into the same sort of music. So I'd, I'd applied at 16, 17 to all sorts of different bands and I'd go and audition in these crummy old horrible sort of rehearsal rooms. Um, so uh, I think I just left college. And yeah, you know, I just auditioned for a lot of bands. There were two on the go. I saw Richie 
uh, went down to his place in, in fact, my dad took him down to his flat in Bethnal Green. And, um, and I thought, I immediately saw something in him um, I thought he's he's a potential. To, even at a young age, I thought he, he looks like he could be a really good frontman. We like the same sort of music. We were quite sort of um, we like the pop of the we like we love a pop song. So we liked sort of you know Duran and uh, you know that sort of stuff in the in in the eighties and late eighties. And uh, I just recognised something in him. So, but it was between him and another band, and I really liked the other band that I was auditioning for as well. And I just on a whim, I was literally going which one, which one, which one. I thought. Well, I'll go with Rich. He's nearer my age, so it's literally like that on the toss of a coin. I thought, well, I'll join Rich's band, and 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 that was yeah, I was about seventeen. So, how explain how the process began about signing the record deal, sort of getting spotted? Were you scouted? How did that work? Um, problems. Okay, so it took us years. I mean, years and years to get a record deal. We were signed twice. We were signed to Virgin. I was about 18, maybe 90. Mm. Recorded an album. It cost an absolute fortune. Back in those days, it cost a fortune. Studio, you can't, you didn't have things like uh, software and like young people have today. Producers can do it all in your bedroom. You had to go into a really, really expensive, I mean, we're talking like a thousand pounds a day for some yeah. of these studios. So we were put in the studio to record an album, and um, and we sorry, spent years. Sorry, Lee, who paid? Who paid for that? Yeah, the record company. So it was they Virgin. did. Okay. Virgin. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So they, I mean, we were on a pitiful sort of wage just to sort of keep us going. Um, mm. But they, yeah, they paid for it, and we spent two years recording it, and then they, the part of Virgin that we were signed to, um, finished. It was Siren Records, and they had to pow and cutting crew, I think, and they and they closed, so we were dropped. So we found ourselves on the dole after that record deal of about two years, something like that. We had to start again. So we went back to the drawing board. This was before Crazy View and those kind yeah. of yeah. records that eventually got some traction. But uh, yeah, it was really depressing, really, really depressing. I mean, a lot of people give up after that. They think, okay, I've had a go, you know, we got signed, it didn't work out, and then they sort of go back to reality. But that kind of gives you the, the, the sort of idea of how both of us were really driven. It was only Richie and I at the time, Thing. I think it was just yeah. us. Yeah. So how did the Mercury deal come about? So we then spent probably another 18 months just writing and writing and writing um, in, in, in Rich's little flat in Bethnal Green. And um, he was a milkman, so he'd, he'd been working, you know, all hours, ridiculous hours. I was on building sites and that. Sometimes we'd go into a studio all through the night and then we'd work in the day, so we were absolutely knackered. But it was the other way, as I said, we were so sort of determined. Um, so eventually we just started rehearsing and writing and then ended up being scouted by a record company. Like we were just phoning them up going, please come and see us, please come and see us. You know, cold calling record companies. They all came down. Some of them left in the middle of our set when we were playing a showcase. You could see them literally get up and walk out, which is crushing, as you can imagine. But one, one guy, his name was Stuart Long. Um, I'm still in touch with him on Facebook. He recognised something in us, and eventually, eventually, we got signed to Mercury. Okay. So how? So after you've signed the deal, um, did you guys have any say in the way that the record company were going to promote you? They were going to brand you. Um, how did that all work, Lee? Because from a personal experience, we never got any of that at all after we signed our deal with A and M. It was just you just go along for the ride and basically do what you're told. So yeah, did yeah. The, did, how did that work for you guys? I suppose similar to a degree. Um, so we were signed to, to two companies. We were signed as right as songwriters to Warner Chapel. So okay. that's the thing. Yeah. So with the Mercury deal, the thing is, obviously, take that. I think you guys were around a little bit before us. Just take that as you guys, um, and at the same sort of time as maybe we were emerging slightly up. You know, boy zone. It was a nine one one. It was a whole spate, and that was nineties pop. Yeah, eighties pop with Duran and Spandau and whatever. So looking back, we were perhaps a little bit more like that. You know, in terms of being musicians, but pop. And I think with Mercury, they wanted their version of a pop group for the nineties. Do you see what I mean? So they're they because they signed sort of bands like Bon Jovi, and I think they had Elton John and. 
but they were bands, you know. So that I think it was our supposedly our unique selling point. You know, we were a band, but we were still going to try and compete in the same kind of place as the as the boy bands, if you like. Yeah. Um, so we had some say with the music, certainly with the music, because they were our songs. So we could sort of have a bit of say in terms of who the producer was going to be. Um, but in terms of the marketing, probably um, less so. You know, the whole machine just sort of took over. And yeah. Okay. You, didn't much. you see, I always found it fascinating because obviously, you know, we gigged a lot together oh. you know, up, up and down the, the country. Um, and I always wondered why you guys were gigging with the likes of us and your worlds apart and these type of bands. Because I always believed that the market that we were targeting was not your market because you guys were proper musicians. You know, we were a visual band. We had an image. And, I, and I'm just wondering, did you ever feel that this was not the way to go for you guys? Uh, I can't lie to you. At the, at the beginning, we thought we were kind of a little bit snobby about it because I think because it took us so long to yeah. get in, even to get a record deal. I mean, we're talking playing every dump that you can imagine, and, yeah. and, you know, playing with, you know, bringing all these drums in. So that's how we cut our teeth. So when we found ourselves being not pushed, but sort of encouraged down the smash hits route, you know, the clothing, yeah stylists would give us clothing and we'd think okay that's really fitting us in with some of the the dancing sort of boy groups and so on and we thought is that is that us but we kind of understood it to a degree because i thought well that's it's not a competition as such but we're we're going to look off kilter if we don't kind of blend a little bit we can offer something different with the with the drums and the guitars and being a band yeah we kind of, we mustn't look like we're out of touch so we accepted that sort of to a degree but the more we got entrenched in promotion, 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 the more we found ourselves miming in clubs and, um, you know, zooming up and down the M1 for years and years and years, playing schools. And I can't, I can't deny that at the time we were thinking this, I'm not it's altogether sure this is quite where we thought we should be pitched. But I do understand where the record company was coming from because the nature of pop in the 90s was doing that kind of thing yeah so you know we could have gone the wet 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 sort of way and just toured and things like that but you know the songs were pop and that was the way to do it as far as the record company were concerned and we kind of just got swept along with it i think yeah it's it's fascinating because we almost had the same path to success it's like gig after gig after gig you, yeah. start, you start in a school, you go to a college, you go to an under 18s nightclub, you finish in an yeah. under 18s nightclub in the, yeah. you know, the middle Radio of the night. Shows, yeah. yeah, you know, doing yeah. six or seven gigs a day. Um, oh, again, it? Yeah, but <laughs> again, mate, I, I come back to it and, I, and in hindsight, I wonder if the record company made a mistake almost labeling you guys <laughs> as a boy band because, you know, listen, you know, the three of you are great looking guys. So I could see the appeal 100%. And, but I, I, I even remember talking to like the lads in, in my band and my band, our band, and thinking, yeah. th these lads are too good. You know, these guys are proper musicians and they're too good to be doing what we are doing. So in hindsight, is it yeah. fair or unfair to say, it, was it a mistake? Uh, hindsight is a brilliant thing, isn't it? Because you can look back and think, well, that's where we went wrong. That's, that's just it. I mean, yes, we sort of, if I ever dwell on it, I do think back and think, okay, if we've done it that way, yeah. then perhaps we've got some sort of longevity. Yeah. Um, can you hear my dog barking in the background? I can't. It's, it's, it's adding to the fun, mate. <laughs> <laughs> it's good I'm shut him out and he's not happy. Um, so, yeah, looking back, I probably... You know, I think all three of us thought to ourselves, why didn't they, why didn't they just tour us? Why didn't we support Wet Wet Wet? And that was actually a possibility at the time to support the Wets, but it never came off. So, yeah, I think so. Maybe, maybe we would have sort of matured in a different way. But again, there's the danger that we'd have just looked a bit, you know, off kilter with what was going on. And sometimes that can sort of be a bit more of a negative, if you see what I mean. They'll just think, well, they're just not very, they're, they're not with the times. Mm. So that was always the danger. So I can understand the way the record company was going. But yeah, I mean, looking back, it, it could have been done differently. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so let's talk about Crazy For You. So the first time that you guys released the record, it didn't quite squeeze into the top 40. P 
purely from an emotional point of view, how did that make you feel? Uh, it absolutely crushed us. It just crushed us. I mean, bearing in mind, we'd been similar, probably similar to you, yeah. you know, we'd been down the M1 forever, just forever. Mm. This, is promoting, this is the first version of Crazy For You. Uh, I think I might have been 17 as well at the, at the time. You know, you go and play a couple of songs. And go. So we were we were crushed when it didn't, didn't chart. You know, it got lots of coverage. We were on, there was a big show called The Chart Show at the time. They yeah. it. We were on Radio 1. You know, it, it was getting a lot of traction, but it just didn't happen. And it, it, it really crushed us. And actually mentally, it had an effect on us. We were all going a bit... A bit mad, if I'm honest. Mm. Just in the back of a, a bus and just touring and touring, working so hard and it not happening. And it was almost back to the drawing board. You know, we'd get a bit desperate, if I'm honest, to try and get mm. this to work. We knew it was a good song. Maybe it wasn't the right mix, which actually turned out to come true. But yeah, it was painful. Really. So when seventeen and then face to face also didn't charm. Yeah. Did yeah. the panic start to set in? Yeah. 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 Panicking. I don't know about the record company. This is back in the day when you had you had a chance to really they had money. It's not like that now. You get one chance and you're out. But yeah, at, sure. at that point, they stuck with us. We had a great team around us. Management, I for me, management was great. The record company was great, and they kept investing and investing. But mentally, it crushed us because yeah, seventeen. That was our next one. And again, if Nick Kershaw was involved, I know you've had a chat with him. Yeah. Um, it just didn't happen. And I remember Rich on the phone in his flat, our manager called him and said, I'm sorry, it's gone in at 40, 40, whatever it was. And he slid down the wall, you know, crushed. And I was with him. We were just in a heap. It was really tough, really, really tough. Did the management and the record company do anything to try and keep your spirits up? Did they support you emotionally? No. Yeah. No, I don't blame them particularly. Maybe they just, uh, I mean, we were very, we were pretty young, you know. Um, so that was, that, that's my point, Lee, is that? Yeah. That's what sometimes these people forget is they've got relatively young lads here that actually need looking after, right? Yeah. I think nowadays it would be completely different. Yeah. yeah. You know, because mental health has come to the fore. There's lots of people that are, that are talking about it. I mean, it was only a few years ago. I don't know if you remember Adam Ann. Yeah, he sure. Spoke about his mental breakdown. And even then, I remember people going, mm -hmm. you know, he's talking about this. This is weird. You know, he's very public about it. And people were quite scornful of him. And that wasn't that long ago. Now things, thank thankfully, have changed. But um, I'm going to be honest with you, mate, I've ended up in hospital a couple of times. Did you? Um, yeah, I won't, I won't go into detail because it's probably embarrassing for everybody, it's including nice, my family. Man. But, you know, nice. yeah, you know, we had tough times. Brave. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so I'm glad it's uh, it's come to the fore now. But no, then it was just you get over it. You just get over it. There's so many, there's, there's other bands that are going to take your place, right? Yeah. There's yeah. Other, another band behind you, and you get a certain amount of time and releases and whatever, and then you're gone. So, mm. so did you ever sort of sit down with the management and the wrecking company and actually have a chat about a new strategy to say, look, this is not working. We have to think out of the box here. We have to do something different. Did anything like that ever happen? Yeah, it did. Yeah, yeah. So we were in the studio thinking, what do we do? We knew Crazy was, I mean, Richie wrote Crazy and we knew it was the one. We just we just knew. We thought it's it's poppy enough to sort of compete with, you know, some of, some of the Take Lats and some of the other bands, yourselves and whatever. We knew it had something, but we acknowledged that the mix perhaps wasn't quite right. So the record company at that time faxed us in the studio, that's how long ago it was, and said... <laughs> You have to do this. You have to get it right. So Richie, myself, and Rob, who's the guitarist, yeah. went in the studio and just with an engineer, we just did it ourselves. We just remixed it. So we added some bits. We sped it up slightly. Um, we made it a bit more kind of, I don't know how you describe it, just a brighter mix. Um, and then, to be honest, we didn't know we didn't know what we had. We didn't have a clue. We didn't know right, wrong, if it was the one, if it wasn't. We knew it was good, as I say, but we didn't know whether this particular mix would would do anything um, and we submitted it to the record company and we knew it was our last chance we knew with this song they were going to put it out again in that summertime of 94 and that was it that was our last chance you see it's really interesting because i i can still remember because because we gigged with you guys for for so long and because crazy was obviously the song that 
everybody just went mad for. We loved it. I personally Eventually. loved it. And then when I heard the new mix of it, which I think you, if I, if my memory serves me correct, I think you shared with it, you shared it with me once when we were in a, in a horrible old dressing room in some nightclub in like Mansfield or Nottingham or something like that. And I was like, do you know what? This sounds a hundred times better. Oh, really? Yeah. Right. I just remember, th and I remember thinking to, the, I remember saying to the guys, man, they've, this is good. This is really good. Oh, um, so what do you, th because obviously we'll get to the, the, the huge success that it had, but yeah. what do you think fundamentally was the big difference? Why did it all of a sudden click? I think it was a combination of the record company literally throwing everything at it. Okay. It was tiny. I think it was, it ended up, so, so if you come right forward now to sort of the last 10 years, the amount of times people have said to me it was my wedding song. Oh, I really? Know, I don't know how you could dance to crazy music, <laughs> ballads, don't you? but nonetheless, it's what people say. So I think it was timing. It was a good summer song, and I remember doing all the summer road shows with, you know, again, yourselves, Peter Ryan, and Ray, and all those, all those bands. And it was summer, and it was quite an uplifting sort of mix of this sort of pop song. And it's just kind of the timing seems to work perfectly. So I think a lot of that is really important in music. You know, you can, you can put, I mean, we could have even put that mix out in the winter of Crazy Few, and it might not have gone the way it did. And it was a very, very slow burn sort of climbing up the charts. Yeah. Um, but I think a lot of it was timing, to yeah. be honest. But when it started to climb the charts, in fact, let's come back a bit, because it charted at what? 24 originally, is that right? Yeah, yeah, it charted okay. in the lower. I remember being in Edinburgh in the back of a in the back of a oh. cab, probably going to another one of those, you know, the millionth gig. Yeah. And the record company said it's gone in at 24. The midweek was 24 or 25. Okay, so were you happy or not with that? Oh man. I mean we ended up in a hotel because at that same time, sorry, so we're in the back of a car and she said, this is the midweek. You get a midweek on a Wednesday, I think. Yeah, yeah that's right. She said it was 25 or 24. And she said, if it goes up or if we're lucky, whatever it was, you might get top of the pops. Yeah. And then we ended up at this hotel and we were running down the street with our, you know, like, like this, you know, trying to get everyone's attention to, um, maybe that was when we were told we were going to get top of the pops. And we okay. were just, I mean, it was like we were, we just freaked out. Absolutely, because I mean, I think it was the combination of years and years of struggles. You know, finally, finally, um, we might get top of the box and we might have a chart hit. So yeah, it was a, it was a moment. It really was a moment. Okay, tell me about top of the pops. What was that like for you? Oh man, well, it's one of those things. I think Sting once I read that he said, "If I only ever when, when I arrived at top of the box, if that was the pinnacle of what I was going to do, it would have been enough." You know, say I've done Top of the Pops. You know, it was just everything. I'd watched it from, from eight, nine years old with all my sort of idols. And there I was, you know, yeah, the way sisters were there. It's a very small studio, do you remember? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So there's a little stage here and they sort of just shepherd the crowd, don't they, from one yeah. stage to the next. So we had Oasis there, we were watching them thinking, that's Oasis, I can't believe we're here. And then there was various other very, very, very famous established artists. And it was just it was a pinch me moment. It was just, it's um yeah. I look back on it and it's surreal, honestly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, and I've never forgotten Lee that the, the most hilarious thing happened. So it was it was being filmed at the old Elstree Studios, if you remember. That's it, yeah. yeah. I lived in a little village in called Brookman's Park, which is about fifteen minutes from Elstree. I know, well, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. And Tony lived in Welling Garden City. So for the first time that we appeared on Top of the Pops, we drove ourselves to the studios in Tony's clapped out Ford Fiesta. Ah, so we got really? there and the security guard, he wouldn't let us in because he um, didn't believe that we were two lads from a boy band about to appear on Top of the Pops. Brilliant. And it wasn't until the fans <laughs> the crowd, literally swarmed the car. He was like, oh yeah, maybe they are a lad from a boy band. Yeah, maybe, able yeah. to get in. Mental, yeah, yeah, isn't yeah. it? Just mental. Okay, so... When it started to climb and climb and climb, and it goes to number two, yeah. which I think, you know, I remember just being chuffed to bits. I, I confess, slightly jealous, <laughs> but chuffed to bits for you. Did you think it was going to get to number one? Um, well, we knew quite quickly. All right, so we were signed to the same label as the Wets. Okay. So the number one was Love Is All Around. We were right. asked, so Love Is All Around came from Four Weddings and a Funeral. That's right. We were asked, and there was an album 
right, of remakes of these songs, of which Love Is All Around was one of them that, that appeared on this album. So that was, I think, all arranged by our record company, Mercury. Yeah, that was the Four Weddings album. So obviously the runaway hit was Love Is All Around as well. We submitted a song, um, they're all covers, so we submitted a song for that album. Well, I Can't Smile Without You is an old uh, Barry Manilow song. Right. But we did it in our way, because I think that song features somewhere in that film. So we knew that film was enormous. And at the back of it, the Wets song, as we know, was enormous. And we, so when we eventually got to number two, we were out, as far as I know, we were out selling a lot of the top 10. It was, people were just buying this record. So we were like, happy days. But we weren't getting anywhere near the Wets because the Wets was just this utterly enormous juggernaut of a song. Mm. So we were talking to the record company because we were, and we were speaking to Marty and the boys and they were quite like, we're actually quite sick of keep playing this song. And we thought, I wonder why the record company doesn't put it. Because the difference between a number two hit and a number one hit is massive. Sure. So if they if they'd have gone, okay, you know, we've got to pause this now. It's been number one for you know five hundred years. We could we would probably have gone up to number one, and it would have made a world of difference to our careers. Yeah. I don't know how true that is. It's gone into sort of folklore and whatever. You know, things change over the years. Your memory changes. But that's my lasting memory of how that kind of went on. We we um, we, we released more to this world charted higher than them with Love Is All Around, did the same top of the pops as them, was just yeah. blown away by Marty Pello's vocals. Yeah. Um, because uh, the director couldn't quite get the camera angles right because he wanted to go straight from the end of our performance to the beginning of their performance and he didn't oh, quite yeah. get it right. Um, so we had to keep doing it over and over and over again. And the guy was just incredible. Um, we went in, charted, disappeared, came back about three months later, charted, disappeared and they were still at number one with lovers all around yeah. yeah i think it still is as far as yeah. i know it's still yeah. there okay so at that time did you think you had made it it was hard not to you were always, i think maybe in the back of your mind hmm. no okay as an adult now again it's it, you can sort of look back and you think to yourself i probably should have known that these things can finish you know at the, the drop of a hat at the time, again, you're so tired, your 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 the schedules are absolutely relentless. Mm. So you, your feet don't touch the ground, you know. When you're if you've got a top five hit, number two hit, whatever, everything is just crazy. So you everybody wants you, you know, because you're of, of the moment. So whatever we were doing in England, we were doing in Denmark and Germany and everywhere else we were in Europe. So I just remember being absolutely exhausted. And just again being swept along with this this film you know, that was just everywhere. Everyone was getting sick of it, actually. You know, I mean, I I I was sick of it because I was listening to it on the radio. It's just relentless. You know, I mean, it was a real moment. It was a real moment for us. And then obviously the pressure comes and trying to release the next one. Um, so there was a mad scramble to uh, get that going. You see, that's interesting because, and, and I really hope you, you get from what I'm coming from here, because because the same happened to us. I think you lost momentum after yeah. Crazy. I think you released the wrong record because I know from my own experience, we most definitely released the wrong records at the wrong time. Yeah. And I remember after we charted with the first hit, I thought, okay, we've squeezed into the top 20, but now we need an even better song to keep that momentum going. And they put out what I thought was one of the worst songs that I've ever heard in my life, respectfully. Then we got our top 10 hit. And I thought from there, right, this is where we now really need a massive song, even bigger than before. Yeah. And we need the momentum to keep going. For me, it was all about momentum. Yeah, and yeah. the next track that got put out, in my humble opinion, was lazy. It was a lazy choice. So you had writers writing yours and how did that work? Did you get involved in the end? With no, any of the... you see, that was the thing that frustrated me yeah. the most because, you know, we were four lads plucked from obscurity, put into this unique position where you're completely manufactured and you're just basically told to do, you're, you're told what to do. Yeah, yeah. And, yeah. You know, as much as I tried to have a say, if I did have any say, I was shot down immediately and told to behave myself and told to remember my place. Um, which, which I did, and I regret that. It's one of my biggest regrets yeah, because yeah. we should have stepped up. Um, because at the end of the day, 
it's it's my life that's on the line. Yeah, yeah, I'm absolutely. the one that has to deal with all the crap that goes with it. Not you. Yeah. You just move on to the next artist. Um, so I always felt really disappointed and let down by that. So I'm just yeah. wondering if you felt you lost a little bit mo of momentum with the next record. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, and, and that, that was born out with a chart position. Yeah. Um, so I think really the record company, and again, I don't blame them, but I think the record company probably thought, well, they've had this, this song that, I mean, my understanding is I've got a hissing on there. It's, I can't remember how much it sold, but I think it was six, oh, yeah, 600,000. My, my understanding is it went up to 800. I don't know how much I'm treat that is. So it's quite, quite a, you know, sizable, sizable number. So I think probably the record company thought we could, we, you know, they could fart and it'll chart. And, um, and it wasn't really the case. I mean, it did chart. I think it got, I don't know where 17 got. I, I can't remember, maybe 10, maybe 11 or 10 or something like yeah, that. I think it was 11, yeah. Yeah, and we were a bit disappointed, no doubt yeah. about it. So we thought it was a reasonable pop song, and we were listening to, uh, I think Capital made it, I don't know, record of the, is it the record of the week, or I don't know, maybe it was Radio 1, I can't remember. But um, there was a fair amount of publicity surrounding it, and, and we got good traction with videos. So, you know, we were on this roll, but it, it certainly, you know, it, it did like, a like take that at the time, once they got going, everything they did just yeah. kept going top five or number one, number one, number one, you see, West it, Live, you know. It was the same, because for me, yeah. whenever they released a song, the next one was even better. Mm. And mm. then the one after that was even better. Yeah, that I got really frustrated with that. Really yeah, I got frustrated. Understand. Yeah, but we were writers. We didn't really have access to other writers. I mean, we should have done because we were part of Warner Chapel. But we kind of had this thing. Well, no, let's. We have to write it. Okay. You know, we've told everyone that we're songwriters, so we have to try and write these tunes. Okay. So we tried it with the next one, which was oh, maybe One Night Stand or Best in Me. Anyway, so. They went up and they went down, and they went up and they went down. But yeah, we we did start to lose. But you're absolutely right. We did start to lose chart momentum. You know, it wasn't the juggernaut that crazy was. It was you know kind of slightly behind the curve. How did you cope with your levels of fame, mate? We just went nuts. I mean, there's you know, I, I know that's a bit of a flippant thing to say, but we we I recognised it in myself. Um, if you've got any kind of fragility. The music business will absolutely find it and magnify it. Um, and you've got to be careful what you wish for. Because, I, you know, when we were working towards it, we would think, please, please let this happen. Please let this happen. But when you, you know, I had I had lots of people outside my house. Most of them were lovely. A few of them not so nice. You know, they'd, uh, they'd be very sort of critical of you. And you'd think, you'd driven all the way to my house to tell me that you hate, me, hate the single. Mm. Very odd. Yeah. You know, and it surprised me the amount of people that um, can fervently, you know, shout obscenities to you, you know, when you've got any kind of level of fame, they, they delight in telling you how terrible you are in all sorts of ways. So that was a downside. And um, and just the workload was, as I say, was relentless. So it was, I, I noticed it in all of us, I wasn't getting on with Richie at all. We really clashed terribly. And it ended up we were in separate cars separate hotel I mean, up to then we were kind of you know in the same hotel rooms and so on and then it was all just going that way you know you couldn't stand the sight of me oh, we were just clashing terribly you know and that kind of is where the rock was setting in and we still had tours that were booked and another subsequent single so that was very difficult very very difficult mate can i just pick you up on on what you said about you know how difficult your relationship became with with richie I, yeah. I, don't, I don't want to go into it too deep because I, I think these things sometimes like what happens in the dressing room needs to stay in the dressing room. But yeah. but why do you think you guys started to clash? Um, I think I was struggling with the whole thing, really. Um, Richie, so Richie was the main songwriter mm. and, and he's, you know, he's pretty good. You know, he's, he's, he's pretty good at what he does. I don't think he does it anymore. I don't, I don't really know what he's up to. But um, uh, it just, I think it, it got to a point where I just felt like I was a bit of a, it was probably a bit ego. There was egos involved. I felt a bit of a spare part to a degree. But I think more than that, I just, the, the fact that we were going sort of in that, sort of coming apart at the seams, if you like, um, 
it's probably down a little bit to my sort of mental health suffering. Um, Richie kind of didn't want to do, as far as I can remember, he didn't really want to do a lot of the the promo. We just were under so much pressure, and I acknowledge that he was under a lot of pressure to try and come up with more songs as well. All of us, you know, we all had to try and contribute. Um, so I think it was it was a combination of all sorts of things whereby we're, we, we were just under this this strain of trying to keep everything going, worried of, worrying about it sort of dipping, um, and just personality clashes as well. Um, and it was it was very difficult in the back of a van when you're not speaking, mm. you know, and you know what it's like. You can spend hours in the back of a car with each other, going here, there, and everywhere. And when we were speaking, we were having these really sort of quiet, nasty rows. Um, so that was really difficult. And in the end, I just thought, this is crazy. You know, it's, it's not doing anything for my work, my well-being. So I just thought, no, I've got, I've got to stop. I've just got to stop. You see, it's such a shame because we had similar experiences. I, I don't think we ended up to the levels that possibly you guys did in terms of not talking and not traveling in the same cars and all that sort of stuff. But I, I yeah. have to be honest, and I'm sure the lads will tell you exactly the same. I'm sure that they got sick and tired of me as much as I got sick and tired of them. And because we were such a visually driven band, I wanted our performances always to be absolutely slick, the very best yeah. it could possibly be. Because I yeah. always felt that, you know, we were, we, our music was the music that was being produced on our behalf um, was always going to let us down. Yeah. I just didn't think it was strong enough. And I mean that with the greatest respect. And I've, I've said this on former chats before. I, I mean this respectfully to the guy, um, but I just felt it was really letting us down. So if the lads, for example, didn't quite pull off a dance move or it, we weren't quite in sync, it was, it used to yeah. really irritate me so much. Right. And it was like, we have to work harder. We have to work harder. And I think I became a pain in the backside because I became so driven yeah. and, and disciplined to make sure that we got it all right, that maybe I became too much of a school teacher. And I've kind of beaten myself up about that over the years. Um, but yeah. it's really difficult when you live in each other's pockets for so yeah. long and yeah. you've got that pressure on you that... You just—I I couldn't switch off, mate. I just couldn't switch no. off from it at all. No, no, no. You, 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 you live and breathe it twenty-four-seven because yeah. it's the only way. Yeah. So was it? Way. So was it a really difficult decision to to sort of call it a day? No, not in the end. No, it coincided with the last record, which didn't even chart. Yeah. And actually, a lot of people now, again, you know, jump forward a few years. People have said it was one of our best records, but yeah, which must have been gutting, came, right? Yeah, it was, but I knew I was going. I mean, actually, before our tour, we did a UK tour. Mm. And it, was, it was very, that was so hard, mate. Was, I mean, it was so hard just to sustain it and to keep going. Yeah. I said, I said prior to this tour, I was trying to negotiate my way out of it. Okay. And the, um, the record company, or well, my manager at the time, Kim, said, you just can't, you know, you, you can't, because they've invested this money and they've planned it. You can't just not go. And I was facing a very, very long tour. UK tour, you know, proper live tour. And I just thought, I don't know if I'm going to be able to do it. I mean, I was on part of it. We were on top of a, bizarrely, on top of a record store in Birmingham uh, in between. So, again, you do all the promotion in the day and then you go and do part of the tour, wherever, wherever date you were in, you do it in the evening. So we were gigging that night and we were also doing promo, a sign or something at H&B, and we did a live show on top of the roof, sort of almost beatles -y style. I'm not comparing this to the Beatles, right? But you know what I mean. The live gig on a roof, yeah? And um, I had chronic, this is terrible, I had chronic diarrhea and sickness oh. because of the, what, the effect it was having on me. So I had a bucket next to me. There are pictures, I've got pictures somewhere of, of me looking absolutely green, running away to this song, and I've got a bucket next to me, and I've just come out of the hotel room having been, you know, chronically ill. Um, so in answer to your question, I knew it was time. I knew I couldn't go on like that, mm. you know, um, but I had to get through the tour and that was tough. That was really, really tough. So how we did were you... Like, Sorry, so, yeah, yeah, so, I mean, it was, we were sort of ended up, it was, it, there were digs going on through the mics, you know, and it was awful. It was just awful. And so I take my part of, you know, responsibility for it. I mean, there were times it was probably quite childish. Um, 
And I don't want to use this platform to dig Richie out, you know, which is why I just say we just clashed, you know, yeah. we just clashed. Yeah. No, we had similar experiences, mate. Yeah. Well, I get where you're coming from because you have to be on your game all the time because it's yeah. so competitive. Yeah, exactly. And we there was so much pressure under us to continually have hits. And we knew, do you know when I tell you, when I knew we were doomed, when we did the Smash Hits tour with Boyzone. And yeah. I remember sitting, and I remember when the first time I saw them, I almost laughed my way out of the office. And I thought, if these guys ever get bigger than us, then we're then you know we might as well pack up today. And I remember sitting back on at the back of the tour bus with Ronan Keating, and he let me listen to the album. And I remember walking off the bus, and I said to our security guy, our, our bodyguard Paul at the time, I said, "Mate, their album's unbelievable, and we're we're done. We're absolutely done." And I really? knew it. I I just remember yeah. thinking it to myself. Yeah. Um, and the pressure of that was like, what do we do? You know, I, I'm not enjoying this anymore. I, I'm not enjoying the fame side of it. It's it's sort of become my poison now. Yeah. I, I, and, and to That's me, a really good word, poison. Yeah, I, I just I, I just didn't like it, mate. I just yeah. I just didn't like it. And I felt yeah. uncomfortable with it. And, you know, I always tried, you know, like you, because, you know, we were, we were together for, for, for months touring so i saw how you interacted with the, with the fans and you guys were always very polite as we were and you always try and be polite but it, there comes a point where you know if you get a piece of paper shoved in your face and they don't even say please yeah. it's like sign this and oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, just say please you know yeah. um and if you don't yeah. do it then the perception of you is <laughs> that, you're, you're that, that, that you're a dick yeah. You know, uh -huh. and you, and I always felt I couldn't win. So did you ever have, you ever have this sign? This is not for me. It's for my sister. I think you're crap. Yeah, all the time. <laughs> did you get hate mail? Yeah, I mean, thank God social media wasn't around. Yeah, thank that, God. That yeah. yeah, we just we got a few. We got a few. We had one that had blood on it. Oh, one yeah. 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 I remember my 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 mother and father got hate mail. I remember. Uh, a, a, a tongue-in-cheek remark about uh, a video that Take That had put out um, in the early days. And I, ju I just made a little bit of fun about it. It was a tongue-in-cheek remark. Mate, the hate mail that my mum and yeah. dad received from Take That fans, it was like sack loads. Um, and I don't think my mum and dad were ready for that either. No. Um, Brutal, isn't it? Yeah, totally. In fact, I, that's interesting. Um, how did your parents cope with it all? My dad loved it. Did he? Yeah, I had to stop them. So if I, if, so if I had a group of um, uh, girls and whatever, some boy girls, boys outside my house, which seemed to occur quite a lot, you know, um, my dad, my actually my mum used to feel really sorry for them because some of them were there all night. Yeah, all night, and they were only young. So my mum used to um, take them out drinks and things like that, but then made the mistake of inviting some of them in. Oh. Now, some of them are very, very nice. I mean, they really are. They're polite and they're respectful and, um, you know, and you're always so grateful that they're there because sure. they're buying records, you know. Sure. The, the audience is your lifeblood, right? But when your parents are inviting them in and they're, they're, and they're stealing your toilet roll or they're, they come out of the loo and they're sort of wandering around, you know, in your, in your parents' house, you know, and I'd say to my mum, no, no, you, 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 can't, you can't do that, mum. You really, you have to you understand that there's a, there's a line that you mustn't cross, you know. But my dad just loved it. Yeah, he used to go out and chat with them all. And uh, yeah, it's, um, but it's, it's weird. It wore a bit thin. I mean, I was always grateful that they were there. But again, when you're, when you're touring so much and then you do get a day off, you feel compelled if there are people outside to go and say hello and take, if it's cold, you know, take them drinks and things like that. But actually, you just want to sleep, you know, you just want to get to sleep. I remember um, not long I had a move to Brookman's Park. And I got a very rare day off and it was a, it was a Monday. I've never forgotten this. It was a Monday. And I thought, Do you know what? I'll go up to the vet's college because there was a veterinary college just uh, around the corner from the village. So I, uh, I took a jog up there and I just wanted to go football training. I just wanted to do a bit of football training. And within 10 minutes, there was, I don't know, 50, 60 people just yeah. watching me training. Yeah. And I, yeah. I, I just, I couldn't believe it. I just, like, yeah. just please leave me alone. You know what um, that's the trade-off. Yeah. Now, don't, 
don't get me wrong, mate. Um, you know, like you, I was extremely grateful for the support. I was extremely grateful that people bought our records. My God, you know, but we wouldn't be where we were if they hadn't have bought our records. So I was extremely yeah, grateful yeah. for it. It's just yeah. trying to sort of give people a different perspective on it all. Yeah. I remember, I remember my father, I flew up to Aberdeen um, because we were doing a gig in Aberdeen and I flew up the day before so I could go and spend the night with mom and dad. And he introduced me to his business colleague as his pop star son. I swear, <sighs> to, I swear to God, man, I, I, oh, I just wanted well, the, the ground to swallow me up. And I gave, yeah. him, a bit, I gave him a bit of a doing in the car. Yeah, 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 home, I get that. You know? Mate, well, just, just interestingly, once the band split up, how did you survive? Right. There, now, I could waffle on, and I'm, I'm obviously uh, sensitive to the time that you have, so I'm going to keep this short. I, off the back of the band, I was taken on by the most incredible... Um, agencies i just thought i don't know what to do i didn't know what to do myself i kept my manager at the time mm. and she said what do you want to do i said i don't know i said let's try presenting maybe acting or whatever i was just one of i was a bit lost and i was yeah. a bit depressed if I'm yeah. Honest. Yeah. So i've got to do something so she said you've got a blank bit of paper what do you want to do so she signed me to, to shane Ritchie's, uh who i knew on and off through the tvs and going okay. live uh, okay. to his manager and then i got sent on loads of auditions um and I managed to work my way through three or four really big presenting agencies. And I tell you something, Nate, I was woeful as a presenter. It very, very quickly dawned on me that I had absolutely no skills whatsoever. Uh, as a, I go to these auditions and it was, it was a Channel 4 show. There was a new game show that I was up for that I went and did a dry run like a test. You know, they do it like a pilot, you know. Yeah. I was terrible. I was absolutely terrible. It was embarrassing. So then I parked that and I thought, oh, I'm going to try acting. So again, off the back of the band, I got signed by a fantastic uh, acting agency that had all these high profile people. I went to EastEnders and had an audition. I went to Hollyoaks. I went to, I went, right, I'll tell you this really quickly. This sums up my experience with it. I was sent to the West End to do an audition for um, Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. It was going to be a big West End show. So I pitch up, there's loads of famous people there. They said, we want you to do, um, play Charlie's dad, Charlie Bucket's dad. And I went, oh, okay, fine. So they sent me a script. They said, they want you to sing two songs, it's a musical, and read the script. I pitch up, there's a line of all these professionals, you know, bloody uh, the director, the producer, the casting and whatever. So not in any way intimidating. I march in there. Part of the script, you have, I'm, I'm playing around with Charlie, father and son, and I have to go, there's pirates on the starboard bow, Charlie, and we're sort of swashbuckling. I thought, and there was a song in the 80s called Star Trekking. I don't know if you remember yeah, it. Yeah. Oh, and it goes, okay. this clean comes on the starboard bow. Yeah, you know, yeah. Yeah. That went in there, in my head. So prior to going in, I'm saying, Lee, don't say this clean comes on the starboard bow. It's pirates on the starboard bow in the script don't say it don't say it don't say it i pitch up in really intimidating piano for the songs all these really important people there's the actor okay lee can you do this two-hander with the actor and when you're ready off you go oh, he does, he's going through the script what did i say what did i say oh god his clean ones on the start of the bow <laughs> there's absolute silence complete silence I went, oh, I'm terribly sorry. Do you mind if I do that again? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> do it again. What did I do again? Oh, you didn't. Second time, I said this. Clean on. Once it was in there, yeah. there was no getting rid of it. I'm glad you're laughing. And then I went on oh, Miranda. Do you remember that comedian Miranda where she says these? Do you ever watch that Miranda show, the comedian, the tall yeah. actress? Right, well, so. she had a similar sort of thing where she put her foot in it and then laugh manically and then run off. So I, I laughed, I cackled, and I said, oh, I bet loads of people have done that. And they went, no. I said, shall I just sing the song? And they went, no, you're all right. Oh, no. So I did the walk of shame. I turned around. Oh, no. I just walked out, tumbleweed. And, you know, again, that was the end of my uh, acting career. So, no, yeah, it's, I went through a lot of that, you know, just doing stupid things, thinking I'll try this and I'll try that. And I was invariably terrible with most things. Do you know what's really interesting is that the, all the people that I've spoken to so far who have gone through similar experiences as us, they all say in the first few weeks and months of 
a band splitting, they all feel lost. Yeah. It's yeah, hard. Yeah, yeah. It's really hard. Yeah, I was absolutely lost. Yeah. I was completely lost. Because you're so busy in the phone. Yeah, at the time, now it's obviously it's email, but we used to get schedules shoved on through the letterbox. Did you have the same thing? Yeah. So the manager would print out all our activities for the force for the for the next month. Mm. And you'd look at it and you think, hang on a minute, so we haven't got a day off at all. No, there's no day off. And you just have to pick your way through all these activities. You know, just crazy schedules every day. And then when you get dropped, it stops dead. Yeah. And it is really brutal do you know the you one go, thing me, go on go on yeah yeah, yeah, yeah that's it you know that's, it just stopped the one thing that i found particularly hard was that i thought that the people who genuinely cared for us and had a duty of care to look after us as young people yeah not once did i receive a phone call from no. any of them particularly the management company to say how are you doing are you yeah. all right? Now, I was very lucky that I kept in touch with people from the record company who kept in touch with me, but from yeah. the management company, nothing, not a bean. And I felt really let yeah. down by that. And they, and they, they do, yeah, they're supposed to be the ones that are your sort of the intermediate between your record company and the band. Yeah. You know, they yeah. should have your best interests at, at heart, but mate, they don't. No, they don't. I don't know whether it's different now. I think there's a, I mean, there is a, there's a real emphasis on mental health and duty of care. But back in our day, nah. you were cast adrift, and this, you labour. And they move on. Yeah. Right, mate. If, and I hope you understand where I'm coming from, from this question. So, if you could have your time again, and if you could change anything, something like, you know, did you do a bad performance? Was there a bad decision that was made? It can be anything. It could be any example. If you could change one thing from your time with Let Loose that might have put you in a different position, what would you like to change? Wow. I'm only allowed one. You're allowed one. I don't... Maybe this changes depending on my mood. I don't think I've done it. Oh, really? Yeah, I don't think so. Seriously? I, so, so I mean, I was going back to the beginning of this, depending on how obsessed I was. And Richie, that was the thing we had in common. We were both obsessed with trying yeah. to be successful. But I wanted to be a famous, I didn't want to just be famous. I wanted to be a famous drummer. I wanted sure. people to go see me and go, yeah, he's good. I mean, yeah. you know, you're in a pop band, they don't care about that. But that's what I wanted. And that, that didn't happen. I just don't know if it was worth it because the ramifications of what, what happened. I've been trying to deal with for the last 25 years, on and off. Most of it's been fine. The adjustment of coming out of a, of a famous band and going back to absolute normal life is really hard. And if you're fragile in any way, like we've discussed, you're in trouble. You really are in trouble. So, you know, if I talk to anyone now that says, I want to be a pop star, again, it's, it's completely different now, but yeah. I was that old adage, be careful what you wish for, because it's not what you think. Yeah, It just isn't. Unless you're really tough and you can just ride along with it and you can deal with it and you don't care about criticism or you don't care, you might be all right. But I like to just think back and think, actually, you know what? My my friends at the time went to uni. I've got one mate that was in, I was in a band with as a kid. He's a music teacher. Should I have done that? I would have probably done that. You know, mm -hmm. gone to uni and studied music. And I mean, I'm teaching now. Yeah. You know, I should have done that years ago yeah the ramifications of splitting up are horrific mm. i went through some horrific experiences um which funnily enough actually put me in a better place because it gave me the strength to carry on yeah um and I'll, I'll never forget that I, I was coming to the stage where I desperately needed to get a job. And I was very lucky that I found a job in a small gym in the old Moat House Hotel in Elstree. But even, oh, step, yeah, yeah. Uh, even yeah. stepping into there, you would occasionally get, oh, God, look at you now. What a fall from grace. Humbling. And I, the, I, so a friend of mine who used to be a, a radio DJ, who is still one of my closest pals, he now lives in America. He said to me, I have a phrase that I want you to use that every time someone says that to you. And he says, just say to them, oh, I'm sorry, 
you must have me confused with someone who gives a fuck what you think. Uh And I used to do that. And I once got disciplined by my boss. (laughs) Um, Because this, this woman, this woman came in and she went, Oh my God, what a fall from grace. And I said this to her over the counter while handing her, her, her towel so she could go for a swim in the pool. Um, And I got disciplined. (laughs) Well, I'm glad you can laugh about it now. I mean, I don't know how you felt at the time, but. Oh, it was, you know, I used to go, sometimes I used to go home and just think I've I've just got to keep going. The thing is, Lee, I knew I had to do it because I had to go, I had to earn a living again. I didn't make any money from that band. I was left in debt and I had to, I had to get back on my feet. I had mortgages to pay. I had, I had bills to pay. I had to put food on my table and actually getting back to work, no matter what level it was and bringing in the income again, actually it took me from down here and it put yeah. me back up here yeah. and yeah. I was able to kick on from there. But the ramifications are so difficult and I don't think people genuinely really know how difficult it is. Well, if you think about um, how people react, sometimes it's in the papers now, isn't it? When yeah. I don't know, East Enders actors and actresses end up, they say, oh, they're now working for uh, Primark or you know, they're working in a shop. Yeah. You and I would think, well, actually, good on you, yeah. you know, because it's a fickle industry and you're working. So that's a really good thing. It's other people that tend to think, oh, boo hoo, you know, you've, you've, you've had all this money and you've done all this fame. And now you've got to be like one of us and just doing a normal job. You know, poor you. Yeah. We don't think like that. We're just trying to deal with getting back to sort of normal, mm-hmm. you know, and they all think we're millionaires. I mean, I got my house out of it. That was it. You know, I still had to work, and, you know, and have an income. But, um, yeah, it's that thing like just don't complain. Don't complain. You know, it's you're so privileged to have been where you where you were but it's just that thing where people don't really know unless you've been in it you don't know Mm. mate it's been absolutely brilliant talking to you um and reminiscing and honestly thank you so much for telling us your story it's been super all right fun thank you all right lee brilliant we will talk again soon all right mate lots of love take Take care. care mate all the best My thanks to Let Loose drummer Lee Murray. If you enjoyed today's watch, I'd be absolutely thrilled if you would please consider subscribing to The Accidental Pop Star here on YouTube. All it does is help me build the channel, doesn't cost anything, and then we will be able to bring you more interviews going forward. We are done. Thank you so much for watching. I really hope you enjoyed the watch, and I'll see you again very soon. Thanks, guys. Bye for now.